Hello, I'm Justin Katz. This is Tiverton on Track, episode 21. This is the weekly podcast of the Tiverton Taxpayers Association, and I'm recording this or going live with this on November 2nd, if you can believe it's November uh, 2020. That's the Monday before Election Day, before who knows what, <laughs> who knows what's coming at, at any level. Uh, so I had a great conversation uh, with town council candidate Joseph Souza for this episode. Uh, this is the final of our four interviews with the uh, town council TTA slate of candidates for town council. So I want to get to that that interview as quick as I can. But an interesting question came up on Facebook, so I want to give it a little bit of attention. So for track one, what school got to do with it? The question was, uh, recognizing that TTA candidates are running for town council and some write-in candidates for budget committee, do they support the school department? And what will they do to help the schools if they are elected? Uh, now, I can't speak <clears throat> for the candidates individually, but I can say that they all take education seriously and we all believe the school department is important. Uh, I mean, it seems like a plain obvious thing to say, um, but in particular, TTA candidates for town council and budget committee have had, do have, and probably will have sooner or later, maybe even sooner, uh, students in the school department. Uh, and many of our, of our activities along the way have focused on improving the schools, including back before it was TTA, <clears throat> when Rob Coulter's wife, Danielle, ran for and was on the school committee for a number of years. So now on the question of what we can do to help the schools from the town side. Now, I think that comes down to, uh, it comes back again to our idea and our emphasis on a long-term plan for the town, a baseline uh, from which decisions can be made. Um, we've got way too much of a tug of war with schools and who do you support them, do you not support them. Back in the FTM days, the financial town meetings, it was red shirts versus yellow shirts. And somehow it always seems to boil down to money. And the thing with that is, in education, money may not be the problem. Maybe it is, uh, but to get to those sorts of answers, you've got to convince your neighbors one way or another. And you've got to convince them rather than subduing them in a budget vote or during elections. Uh, and the way you do that, the way you get to answers without having to resort to that, is to get everybody on a, a common ground where you can start from, start from a, an agreed upon basis. So you have a plan, and that plan includes things like a predictable process for spending money and maintaining buildings and other infrastructure. Then, you know, if, if you have a windfall, you can pour that into your plan, or if, if more money is needed in a given year for schools or for anything else than you predicted, you've got a starting point, and you understand why, and well, the people who want the more money can make the case for why, and then when they, if they make that case, you look at how that affects other spending. If we spend more on this, will that go down? And what will taxes do? Who will that affect? People in uh, the, the lower value houses versus the higher value houses. These are all things you can only look at if there's <clears throat> something on paper. Now, if this were how we did things, we could identify the actual causes of problems. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we could identify the challenges and address them specifically. And it wouldn't always necessarily come down to money. And if it did come down to money, then everybody kind of understands why and what the objective is. And you, you can lose all the heat and the accusations and the insults. Uh, so this is basically what it comes down to is if you have transparency and intelligent planning, you know, our election, our elections, our financial town referenda, they won't have to feel like winner take all. And I think that's basically what TTA candidates and TTA office holders like me have tried to work toward over the years and increasingly as, you know, as we settled into the, the battle and started to get our heads around the issues we're facing, we're, that's definitely the, the central focus. And I also think it's, it's the only way to end all of the distrust and all of the animosity we've been seeing around town. Now with that, I'm gonna to get to track two, which is town council candidate, Joe Souza. I'm here today with Joe Souza, one of the TTA slate of candidates for the Tiverton Town Council. Um, the idea of these, these uh, interviews, Joe, has just been to give people just a basic background of who the slate of candidates are, where they come from. And so the first questions I've been, I've been asking people is, apart from politics, just tell us a little bit about your, your background in Tiverton. Um, how, you know, you've been here your whole life, I think, right? So just just that sort of background on a personal level. Well, 
pretty much if you were conceived in Tiverton, you were born in Fall River. So I was born in St. <laughs> Anne's Hospital. But uh, we, my parents lived in Tiverton for a few years, and we moved to Portsmouth. My father, as a Sousa, grew up on Carpenter Street, North End. A lot of family in Tiverton. Uh, in 1978, I joined the military and didn't come back to Rhode Island until 1992. I got out of the military and stayed down south, ran a gas station, did a bunch of other stuff. So I, I you know, just recently retired this year permanently. I'm not even working part-time anymore. Hmm. So I've got the time to put in to actually help the town now. Previously being on the budget committee, it's not as much a commitment as the council. I, as I learned on my other term in the council that it's, it's very time consuming. I would spend three nights a week just reading over the material so I could understand the agenda that came on Thursday. Uh, it, it was kind of complicated because it took my weekend up, but, uh, but my commitment to Tiverton is this. I moved back to Rhode Island in 1992. I bought this house that was built in uh, 1901. I've invested a lot of money in it and I plan on staying here. I just like the area. I love the restaurants. I like to go walk on the beach. I like everything about this place except some of the politics. So I'm hoping that uh, we can work together and make some changes there. And a lot of people, you know, I'm a bit of a hothead. I blow my cap. But when I see the things that I've seen happen to businesses in this town, or just families that were just trying to use their property for what they want to use it for. So I'm a bit of a, you know, I believe people have property rights. I believe people should be able to, within limitation, I mean, you know, if you're not going to have a pig farm next door to me without me complaining. <laughs> I understand things like that. But, you know, if you want to have a boat over there, I don't think we should be sending the building. That, I, that's some of the issues that bother me in this town is that people like me feel that there's so, you know, it's too oppressive. You know, it, it, so I'm a, it's one of the reasons why I've always opposed a lot of spending in our building and planning departments and things, but I understand we need there too. I mean, you have to have proper planning. You know, zoning is important just for issues where people would abuse their neighbors. So I understand that government is needed, but it has to be as limited as possible. So we're not, you know, becoming a, a dictatorship and, you know, because the wrong people can get in government and, be, and just want to, you know, regulate everything. We see that so much in this state. I've lived in several different states. Uh, I did business in Virginia. Taxes down there and property taxes and things were nowhere near the burden they are up here. And, you know, and it, it affects people's quality of life. I mean, if, if dad has to work two jobs, then he's not seeing his kids. And I'm, I watched my father work two jobs, never saw him. So I, you know, I just think limited government and limited, you know, burden on people as far as taxes helps make better and closer community and family. So that's my principle in, in looking at, you know, the size of what, what our government should be. Basically, only as much as we need. Right. Well, I, I know um, from my time on the council, there was, I often got calls or messages from people asking about the building and zoning stuff. I, they wanted to do something that looked fine or they had gone ahead and done it, built a shed, it was a little too big or it was not the style that was allowed. Some some of that, as you say, I mean, you, you need some some regulations so people aren't going crazy. I mean, people have rights to, you know, live in a nice community, yeah. but some of it just goes so far. You're, you know, if, and it, it, the worst part is it seems like it applies unevenly. You know, if, if you happen to be the one whose shed is targeted and seen, then it's a problem. So you started out, was your first role in government in Tiverton on the zoning board, something like 20 years ago? Was that where you started? Yeah. Well, and also when, um, when, when they, I worked with Linda Michelle to help promote the charter, I wasn't on the charter commission, but I felt it was such a good idea that I helped to promote it by going out and telling people about it and putting things out in stores, you know, public information. And then that led yep. to me working with some of the Democrats on their campaigns, like former Senator Enos, friend of mine, who we 
used to argue a lot, but we always, we could get along. I, you know, I supported him, but at one point my, uh, philosophy would turned out to be a little different than a lot of that party. So I kind of left that party a few years ago. I'm now unaffiliated and, uh, I won't go too much into that. I'll just say that I just didn't agree with their philosophy anymore. So that the, was the, uh, the original formation of the town home rule charter? Yes. So you were promoting yes. meet, meetings to give feedback and that sort of thing? Yeah, we didn't... actually even made up like boxes and put uh, in, in uh, local stores and stuff so people can get a copy of the charter to read or the, the, abbre the Breeders' Digest version, rather, you know, the abbreviated mm -hmm. version to, you know, to promote it. And uh, it was a good thing and it got me involved and I met a lot of people in town. And I always find that, you know, Anytime you volunteer for something, you meet the best people in the world because the best people in the world are the people that give of themselves. That's my opinion. <laughs> and those are the people I want to be around, people that are willing to do something to make our you know, life better, not just sit on their butts, complain, and watch TV. That, those people I have no use for. I like active people that give back. I don't, you know, I mean, you look at this COVID stuff, there were people that were making masks for people and People just, anything they could do to help somebody, they got involved, you know, and that's just great. I, that, mm -hmm. Those are the type of people I like to be around and be involved with, which is probably why, you know, I used to go to a lot of different meetings, even like, you know, and then eventually I got on a zoning board and I was an alternate at first, but a couple of people dropped off and I was, I was a regular member, right? Almost within a few months. And I served on that and I had a couple of problems at the end, which people are probably familiar with, but that's, you know, life goes on. <laughs> you know, hey, you know, I've seen, that's why I have so much respect for our police department, because I've seen how professional they are on both sides, mm -hmm. you know, and they were very professionally treated me cordially. Unfortunately, you know, the things that I was accused of, you know, we're proving that I didn't do it and they let me go. But, you know, it's a, I saw justice firsthand and it, it was a learning experience. And I learned also, you know, to change my attitudes and the people I hung out with. I mean, I wasn't a perfect angel in my younger years. I got into a lot of crap, racing cars and, you know, but I'm 60 now and I just don't have the energy anymore, I guess. <laughs> you know? Age has made you safer, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but you know what, on both sides, I always, I've always had respect for the law because like even coming out of high school, like all the guys I went to school, a lot of them became Portsmouth police officers and we still hung out together. So I've never had a problem with law and order or, or, and I, I respect our fire department. I love the people that volunteer for all like the Fort Barton, you know, the, all the volunteers that go over there and just do all the work so it doesn't burn the town and they create such a great service for us. And that's what's great about Tiverton is, well, you got a lot of people like me now <laughs> retired to have time to give back to society. And that's, that's the type of community I want to live in. Well, I know even, I mean, even before you reti retired, you would do things like help with construction project at the senior center and that sort of thing. Yeah, well, we saw something that's all too terrible in this town is that we allowed our senior center roof to get so bad that they had a 55 gallon trash can with a bilge pump <laughs> in the um the center room where they have all of yoga and they, whatever you know the, the exercise room there mm -hmm. meeting room so and you know we just couldn't see that happening anymore so i i talked to my boss and he thought it would be great publicity so he did volunteer Newport roof uh, actually gave us, a, let us use all the equipment, the trucks and the crews and everything, all the safety equipment helped orchestrate everything to get, uh, we got three sides of the roof on one side, the town paid for, and then the rest we put on. And I'll tell you it, I felt, you know, if, if this could grow and other people would get involved, but and other people did. We also went back and we insulated <laughs> the fire station and uh, the senior center with the blow-in yeah. insulation. And yeah, now- Rob Coulter still talks about that. <laughs> well- uh, The, the heat and the- <laughs> Brett Pelletier was doing mm -hmm. the spraying. 
and he got so covered with the, it looked like he changed, like, because he had black hair, and then when he came out, it was all, like, gray. <laughs> like, he had a, his beard was all full. It was so funny to watch. Yeah, he well, was great. He, a lot of people come over and help, though. It was great. It was fun. Yeah, and for, for people who, who don't know, I mean, at that time, Brett Pelletier was a good guy, but he did, definitely not necessarily politically aligned with a lot of stuff some of us nah. agree with. Uh, but that's... But that's, it shows that, was, that we can get along. See, that was the thing, too. Okay? On the stuff... We agree on, we need to work together. And then the stuff that we don't agree on, if we can't negotiate it, yeah, we're going to fight, fight, fight. But at some point, I mean, we have, and that's something that people tell me all the time. It's so bitter. Everybody's, it's like the Hatfields and the McCoys, but, but you know, they don't really understand a lot of the issues and they don't going to get into the details. And there's probably a lot of justification on one side or the other for the arguments. But in general, it's better for the public if we try to work together to reach a solution. And then, you know, this landfill situation. I mean, I remember going when I was, even before I was on the council, I was going to landfill meetings. And there's been a, a group in town that have been trying to close that landfill for a decade. And it's been a group of us that have been trying and thank God Donna kept that going and got it in. Right, but this year. when I was on the council, we passed a resolve to have, uh, or uh, whatever it was, to have engineering done to show that we could extend the life. And a lot of that information, I think, was used now because now we're going to be able to do the cap like we originally, because the, the height of... Don't quote me on the number. It was like we could go up to like 156 feet or something. But we're really not there because every year the landfill settles under its own weight. Mm -hmm. So, and so, but we had a group that was going up to DEM. Oh, they're polluting the water. They do that landfill has wells all the way around it. And we've been open for over 40 years and haven't had a dirty test. So that landfill is not polluting the groundwater. If any, a lot of people don't understand the construction, but the water doesn't go all the way through the landfill. It just like hits the top. It might go down a little bit and then it runs out the side. So the stuff that's way underneath never gets wet. It only got wet when it was, you know, 20 at feet. The top, yeah. yeah. So, so the, so anything that's buried under there is the skeleton, you know, that are buried under that landfill are there forever. And most of it's probably decomposed. But the bottom line is the landfill is safe enough that we can get a few more years out of it. We got to keep the pay as you throw. Although it's been unpopular, people don't like buying the bags. We've got, what, $8 million, not close to $9 million in the bank. So, I mean, we're only going to have to probably smoke a small bond no, one, maybe two million at right now. But if we can keep a couple more years and keep the money coming in as pay as you throw, we might not even have to float a bond to close that. Because, you know, a 12 or $14 million bond, what kind of hit is that on the tax rate, you know, on top of the other increases we have every year? Well, and so, part of it too, the state's limit was changed to the, the height or the, the amount of, that can go into it, not the amount of time. So the pay as you throw keeps yeah. people recycling and yeah. it'll keep, give us a little more time. So I, I think I, I definitely agree that we need to keep that going. So how, I, I think more and more people are recognizing we, we do have to find ways to work together in town. Mm -hmm. what, how do you think we can make that happen more? I mean, what, what's the issue? Well, I hope that people will do it at the voter booth. And, you know, when you go in to vote, Try to look at the history of some people and see who worked for the betterment of the town and who basically just got in there and wanted to just stop any progress because they're either got an R or a D behind their name. You know what I'm saying? So it has, it has to be up to the people. We're responsible for our own government. We get the government we elect. So it's, you know, I, we have to be informed. We have to know what these people have done in the past so that we can base it, have a, a good judgment when we're going to the voter booth. That's the only thing that ever worked. Hmm. And, you know, I, we, you try to publicly educate people and, you know, I mean, that's all you, that's all we can do as citizens is try to help each other understand what's going on. That's basic and it's simple enough, but 
it breaks down sometimes when you have people that are just so partisan one way or the other, you know, they only see red, you know, or, you know. I see a little too much red, like anger. Yeah. Yeah. It's a dysfunction syndrome, you know, like the guy around Trump, you know, it's. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a weird year like that. So after the election, you're on a town council, hopefully with a majority uh, Tiverton Town uh, Taxpayers Association. What's what's at the top of your agenda? Well, you know, I'm, I'm watching today and the governor's talking about jacking up more uh, COVID stuff when we really don't have those numbers out here. So one thing I would like to do is, is you know, it really bothers me when I was reading the police reports and I'm seeing that we have police officers going into businesses doing checks, hmm. you know, and it, to me, that's a tactic that shouldn't be happening. And I know why it's happening under this current administration, but I want to do more to help business. So that would be my first thing is to try to work in a way maybe we can knock off inventory taxes or something like that to try to help the local businesses that, you know, are not bringing in anywhere near the dollars they were. I mean, your average restaurant, you think about it like family ties. Out of all the money that moves through that place, I mean, the state gets 7% of it right off the bat, you know, plus, you know, meals tax, your workman's comp and everything else, yeah. you know, all the inspections that they go to, the boiler fees, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So they, their profit margin is so small that they needed the volume they have just to make the 2 3% they were making off the top, you know? So I, it's so we need to try to, you know, I think help the small businesses. And I don't want to just put it on the burden of the homeowners. So whether it's, you know, give them more ability to do more through, you know, zoning relief, you know, where they can, you know, use areas that maybe they weren't able to use before for dining or whatever, whatever we can do. To, that's, that's one of my priorities. And the second would be, of course, to always, you know, make sure that our, uh, our, our, you know, departments are running properly. So we have, don't have any inefficiencies there. Uh, Chris Carter, I've known since I moved back to Tiverton, he was chairman of our budget committee. And uh, I've always had, you know, mix, you know, we've always had agreements and disagreements like most people do, but I've always got along with Chris. And uh, except for certain issues we argue quite a bit about, but I mean, we could always argue about it and then go back and talk about something else right after that, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, it wasn't like knockdown, drag out fights we had. We always, and I like Chris, and I honestly, I know a lot of people will maybe think I'm crazy, but I think we should have a town administrator that actually knows Tiverton because the last three couldn't find four corners with, you know, a GPS and two roadmaps. So, I mean, it's, I'm serious. If they know nothing about the town, so they're totally reliant on the employees for any, and I, this, you know, it still goes on some of the department heads we, fought, we hire. They know nothing about the department, so the employees have to like do their job, you know, to bring them up to snuff. And then when they find town administrator, they finally get up to snuff a little bit, and then we find somebody else. <laughs> you know, I mean, Woshek to me was he came in green, but but just when he started to be trained and knew everything and did the employee handbook, boom, they fired him and hired some politician out of out of Newport who rode his bike to work and wanted to shower in his office for God's sake, you know. <laughs> That's, I'm not exaggerating. This stuff happened. And yeah. this has been councils, not my, not a council I was on. Yeah. You know, it was the ones people elected. So, I mean, so if you wonder why things are so screwed up in town, it's the people you're putting on the council. Yeah. You know, it, it seems like with a lot of, especially with town administrators, what happens is they start to figure things out. They start to come up with a plan and that ruffles somebody's feathers because somebody somewhere always likes it the way it is. And then once that starts happening, that's when the, the friction starts and they start to get pushed out. Well, you see, this is where, I don't know, my first thing I, I said to the administrator and the solicitor is, I'm not going to agree with every decision you make, but the last thing I want you to do is say something that you think is going to make me happy. If tell me the truth, tell me 
you're wrong. You know, tell, tell, you tell me I'm wrong if I'm wrong. I might not agree, but at least I have a legal opinion, you know, so if I screw up, I knew I was told already. But <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it sounds funny, but I've watched a, a solicitors for the town just make decisions because that's what the council president wanted. And then the town gets sued. And then we pay that same solicitor tens of thousands of dollars to defend the decision that he knew was wrong. But that's what the, and if you think I'm exaggerating, four corners, okay? It's, it started under Louise Durfee with the hassle in four corners and with decisions. And then we'd be sued and we'd lose those decisions. And, and they, what they were trying to do was to wear the business owner down to get their way using our tax dollars. So, and it's their own personal battles and they use their solicitor to fight them. We pay for it. And that's why we have these bills and, you know, enormous solicitor bills. And, and I've talked to solicitors in other towns. I'm not gonna mention their name because I'd like to hire a couple of them to come here. But uh, they tell me they can't believe the civil fights we have over here. It doesn't happen in their town. They, they, you basically, the homeowner is supposed to sue and seek you know, remediation, not the town go after it and claim it's a zoning and make up some phony zoning stuff like we did with uh, uh, Eagleville Road. It was LAL at, the, at, at that was point. Was that site ready? Yeah, site ready now, yeah. I mean, we literally got our butt kicked off of the property by the court. They couldn't even send the town administrator or the building inspector over there. And that's the type of stuff that's aggravated me. And then they do it all in executive session and swear you to silence. So if you come out and talk about any of it, you're civilly liable. I mean, come on. You know, that's one thing I agree with the TTA is that ex executive session should only be used for like personnel where you can't, you know, do it in open session. Right. But when you're just talking about things that are happening in town and they say, well, you're going to give away your strategy, but anybody knows if you go to court, both sides have to present everything to each another before they even go into court. You don't go in there with some, Oh, I got gotcha you moment. You know, it's, it's like, so we're not giving away any information by having that type of a discussion in open session. Right. It's, well, the, the decision to go after a homeowner isn't a legal discussion. It's a policy discussion. I mean, that, that's what people ought to be able to see is you saying, yes, let's go after that guy for his shed or for this garage or for that, uh, what they're- Well, they're you take, reading. for instance, the motorcycles out on Brayton Road, okay? That was definitely a civil matter. The town can say, well, they didn't have the permits, blah, blah, blah. But if you look, I mean, what they end up doing is they'll pass this- they, as soon as something erupts, then all of a sudden they need a new ordinance. And then I saw it, if you look at Randy with the shooting range, we didn't have an ordinance. They tied the guy up for over a year before they dragged him through the planning board. They changed the design of the building, which made it worse because they put the fan, the exhaust fan out right next to somebody's house where it could have been put up on the roof inside of a parapeted wall, which would have shielded the the noise. Instead, the planning board said, you got to have a pitched roof and you got to put that out in the backyard, which took up some of his parking lot. Mm -hmm. Okay. In my opinion, that was designed to limit his business because then they also went after him parking on the street. And that's the type of thing I'm talking about. They didn't like that type of business and they used the town. You know what I'm saying? And the town's uh, planning board and stuff to go, you know, change, they'll change policies it's just crazy. And then that neighbor had to put up with that fan out there blowing now. It's crazy. I feel bad for that neighbor. They end up insulating his house and putting in like stick of windows. Yeah. So he doesn't have to hear that fan running all, you know, till nine o'clock at night when he has, you know, in the summertime, he can't even open the windows. Right. So, so that's, that's one of the reasons why I got so loud about, you know, our zoning ordinance. I mean, it really needs to be and we really need to look at who we put on the zoning and planning board. We need to have a balance of, you know, people that live in the neighborhood along with people that are in the trades and understand that, you know, it's not feasible to do that kind of stuff. You know, you should have done it because that's what we lack is that knowledge of building that led them 
to tell him, oh, you can't have a flat roof with a parapet like every other building should have in this town. Even down where they built uh, Tom's, they put all of those things in the back of the building because of the way they did the code. And now the neighbor in the back, who was a former councilman, had to complain about all those compressors running out there. They could have put them all on the roof with a parapet wall and the sound would go up instead of out into the neighborhood and bouncing off that cement block wall that's on the back. Yeah. It's technical, but it's little things like that that if, if they don't understand it, why are they looking at, and then I see the codes that they're passing, you know, so we really need some professional help to redo our zoning and planning codes and try to get not just like copy middle towns, but hire somebody to actually go through and bring us something that works for Tiverton. It's an investment, but it would pay off in the end because we probably could get more business in here along with pre-zoning. Instead of having to go to the planning board, you should be able to buy a lot. It should be pre-zoned. You should know what you can put there before you even make the purchase. You shouldn't have to make a temp, you know, like put it the purchase you know, it, and then say, okay, I'm gonna go to the plan board. Then a year later, find out you can or can't do it or what they want and then have to go back. Now, Fall River, that's why Fall River, you see the industrial park out there selling lots because everything was pre-zoned. You go to town hall, I wanna put up this building, you pay the money for the permit and you put it up within a few months. You don't have to be dragged through zoning and planning. That should all be done. The property should already be zoned and the planning, everything should be in place. Yeah, and if I, we, I think a lot of that comes down to if if you set up rules that you can put in a zoning code, they've got to be simple and they can't cover every detail. But a lot of people, no. I think, want to use town government to cover. They want to be able to design the town themselves. So they want to be able to see what you're going to put there before yeah. they tell you if you can put it there. I was looking at a property around here recently and and it, it be, it's a great spot for commercial stuff, but I think it's in a zoned residential and that's in the zoned residential, but great potential. Well, no, that potential means you have to go through town government to get them to change rules for you, which yeah. is, can be deadly. And what they'll do, uh, you mentioned how they change rules. Uh, the, the Sousa Road development years and years ago, it was, as I recall, it was a relatively small development somebody was going to put in there. They were yep. going to put in a library for us, build it yep. for, as part of the project. And last minute, the zoning changed. And then what do you get? Then it's suddenly bigger and bigger projects trying to use that valuable land because the little project that might have been good at the time won't work. It's just not- Well, really the, lot, the lot across the street on Sousa Road, which used it was residential and then the, the latest developer wanted to put like a hundred and some houses in there. That was light industrial. Yep. That was all light industrial land. It could have been, you know, you could have seen some small, like we've seen a lot of development along Fish Road, but even then they've wanted to change the noise, dust, and to make it so that if you're out there running a, like an impact gun to take a tire off to do service on your truck, you'd be violating a noise ordinance. And that's how bad it's got. So I understand separating neighborhoods from light industrial and commercial. <clears throat> Excuse me. But when you have a light industrial, you can't tell them, well, you can't even run an air gun out here or, you know, have a, or you gotta, you know, it's crazy. You can't start your truck until seven o'clock or, you know, most of these guys that work construction, they're out the gate at 630 so they can be at the job at seven or something like that, especially if they're going to Boston, they might even leave earlier. Mm -hmm. We've had instances with businesses. It wasn't even that the neighbors were complaining. It was people that live like out in the South End that go around and peep at everybody. There's a few of them. I don't know. I call them the fence. You know, they look over your fence to see if you have a car in the backyard and then they call the zoning. And if you think I'm crazy, I'm telling you, these people are out there. They're the ones that'll tell you we have so many code violations that we need another code officer. It's not that bad. I mean, the town is not that bad like that. Yeah, I remember Tiverton, old enough to remember Tiverton, used to have a lot of pig farms, even up in the North End. And most of them are gone now. I didn't, I didn't really complain about the ordinance and say no about pig farms because they were terrible. I mean, and it, you know, the people didn't even try to make them clean. I mean, they were, 
And back then they would say you would save everybody would save their rubbish in like buckets outside. And the guy would go around and dump all the buckets in his buckets and feed the pigs and just dumping it right on the ground. So you can imagine the maggots and the flies and things. And, you know, that needs to be cleaned up. I mean, the public health ringworm, I think, was the biggest problem back then. So you need, you need to have zoning that pertains to public health and safety. That is important. You need to have building codes so that people don't buy a house that's made out of toothpicks and not know it because that's why inspections are important. I, that, that stuff is, you know, so important. And it's so important that it happens right, you know. So it's important that we have good department heads that can handle this, you know, even the fire codes. A lot of it is important, you know, for public safety and restaurants and things and making sure that businesses, you know, clean their grease trap or, you know, the ventilators and things so they don't have big fires. Mm -hmm. So, I understand all that. And, you know, we have, a, we have good public service in this town and I want to help preserve that. And on the budget committee, I, you know, we get a lot of crap. We want to cut everything, but I voted for like several ambulances, fire trucks, you know, for a, a engine, uh, tankers and myself. I mean, on the budget committee, I like to go out and look at all this stuff. So I'm very familiar with what we have in this town as far as a fleet of vehicles. And, uh, you know, we do need some improvements. And in other areas, we're doing good. We can do what we can each year. But I take that very seriously, that our public safety. We fought uh, on, when I was on one budget committee. We, so we buy three police cars one year to the next. And that's kept our fleet new for the frontline officers who may have to drive 100 miles an hour to catch somebody. We just robbed the bank. It happens. Mm -hmm. And then those cars move down to the department heads or, or the, um, you know, like the lieutenants or something might use them or detectives might, you know, use them or whatever. So we've come up with some good plans that are still in place. And I think that's been some of the work of the taxpayers group because it was a pretty much our idea. I mean, it's, we've worked hard to make sure, and that goes back to Tom Parker. So if on the budget committee, it's, it's that's the type of thing I think we've done as a group, though, as a taxpayers group, is to try to put something in place so that we have not only con you know a continuous continuity, but it, it's something that's in place that works, that makes sure that we have what we need. Because a lot of those cars that go to the second line, we rent them out to construction companies, and I know that comes out of our other pocket on the state end. No, most of it does anyway, but you know it, it pays money back into the town. So I don't know. I mean, it, it's, to me, it's important. It's important stuff. And it's important as a counselor that we make sure that everything is efficient. That way we can afford everything we need. I mean, if you waste money, it's going to catch up in some other area. For years, I watched the roofs on the high schools. And I'm not running for school committee, but we screamed about it because we had to float bonds. I mean, it would just, there was a hole in the floor behind the auditorium on the stage. It was a hardwood floor, and there was a hole in it, like the wood. And it was literally because of a leak. I mean, how long does it take for water dropping on the floor to push a hole through hardwood? <laughs> I mean, there was a hole in it. Takes it, time, yeah. it. I've never seen anything like it in my life. <laughs> that roof leaked for years. And it wasn't until, you know, we started getting these big tax increases because of that neglect, you know, I mean, it would give raises every year, but not put a dime into the roofs. And that's something we've tried to stop. And you'll notice now that our schools, we, we did another bond and we've got, a, but we, like Jim O'Dell, who's a member of the tax group, worked in the schools as a contractor to help as much as he could with his knowledge. And we supported those bonds. And, it's, you know, we catch hell about it, but we supported it because we know that if you don't fix the roof, the rest of the building gets destroyed. The electrical gets full of water, the walls get full of water and mildew. It's so important to have a good roof. We scream about it. It's like, a, and I've been screaming about Ranger School that needs major repairs. The library falling apart. I got involved in that because, I mean, I could see a piece of the library falling right off. The building's 
we got another 20 years to pay for that library and it's already starting to deteriorate. It, you know, they, it's, so those are the things I've been, you know, people say, oh, you bitch too much, but you know, it's because I don't want to go another year and then find out, oh, well, we got to float another barn now. Yeah. You know, I want to see it where we can manage and maintain our buildings within the annual budget. So that's, you know, make it so that every year we put so much into the buildings so that we never have to float another bond again. And we can get there. It's going to take time. I mean, it's not like something we'll do in 10 years. It's it, because we're so far behind. But if we start the process now, the next generation won't inherit what we did. I so guess. Like a landfill. I, yeah. I think maybe that should have been our, our slogan for this campaign was put a new roof on Tiverton. It seems, it seems like a pretty good metaphor, but I, we've, we've gone for a good long time. I hope people have, have found this very informative and uh, I hope you, you do well on Tuesday and we can start the new council with uh, some good traction and get things under control like you're talking about. So thanks for, thanks for coming on and talking to me for a bit. Okay. And thank you for watching. I hope you, as I said, I hope you find this, found this informative. I hope you found this whole series of episodes interviewing the town council members under the TTA slate for this election as a four-part series. Uh, you can find the rest of them, at least when I get this one up, you can find them all at uh, tta2020.com. That's information about the election and the candidates, letters to the editor, the platform, other things like that. And you can find all of the episodes of Tiverton On Track going back to when we started, when it was audio only, on tivertonfactcheck.org, as well as various podcast services. This one will be an audio-only podcast if that's the way you like to get your information. Uh, those can be found on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and all of those. So thank you for watching and for listening, and be sure to vote. Uh, if you watch this after the election, you know, take the opportunity to put the next one on your calendar. Probably the financial town referendum this spring is going to be an important one. So in the meantime, stay safe out there.